Good evening. My name is Moira Shuri, and I'm the executive director of Zocalo Public Square. Welcome to our discussion, How Have Women's Protests Changed History? This is the opening of our When Women Vote event series presented in partnership with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. The museum's virtual exhibit that commemorates the 19th Amendment is called Rise Up LA, and it kicked off this week at nhmlac.org. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to each other. Everything we do is free. Everyone is welcome. We publish ideas, journalism, and convene events like the one we're watching today. Find out more on our website, zocalopublicsquare.org. Today's discussion on how women's uprisings have altered the course of history is moderated by Rinku Sen. She is on the board of the Women's March and is also a political strategist and author of Stir It Up and The Accidental American. Over to you, Rinku. Hello and welcome to Zocalo Public Square. I'm Rinku Sen. I am the co-president of the Women's March Board of Directors and I'll be guiding our conversation this evening as we discuss how women's protests have changed history. I'm so excited to introduce our panelists for tonight. They are as follows. Valentin M. Mogadam is a professor of sociology and international affairs at Northeastern University and was previously the director of women's studies at Purdue University. She studies global women's movements and feminist networks, focusing on the Middle East and North Africa. She has authored several books and her forthcoming work focuses on the effect of social movements after the Arab Spring. Juhi Judy Han is a cultural geographer, organizer, and assistant, uh, and assistant professor of gender studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. She studies, writes, and creates comics about religious politics and feminist and queer activism. Her current research examines protest cultures and solidarity politics in South Korea. Francille Roussan Wilson is a historian and professor at the University of Southern California who studies black labor movements, black social scientists, and black women's history during the Jim Crow era. She was on the advisory panel for the National Ar Archives exhibit, Rightfully Hers, American Women and the Vote. And she is also the co-curator of the Natural History Museum Museum's exhibit, Rise Up LA, A Century of Votes for Women. Thank you all so much for joining this conversation. Let's get started with our amazing panel of um, historians and scholars. And uh, big thanks, of course, to Zocalo Public Square and the Natural History Museum of LA for hosting us tonight. So I'm gonna start with Francille just because of the week that we're in this week. It is the 100th anniversary of the uh, passage of the 19th Amendment and of uh, American women. Um, the story goes of American women getting the right to vote. So I'd love to ask you, Francil, to start us off with a bit of your thinking and your wisdom about who do we not hear about so much in the suffragist uh, narrative in the US uh, story of how women got the right to vote and what they then did with that. Who's been missing from that broader story? Thank you, Rinku, and thank you to my to Zocolo and to my honored colleagues. I I want to say that there are tens of thousands of women that we don't hear about. We hear about Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Alice Paul, but we don't hear about the black brown indigenous women, the Chinese women, the other Asian American women that also joined the struggle for the vote. And so many of those women did not actually get the right to vote in 1920. So what I think people don't understand is that by 1920, women in 27 of the US states had actually had already had the right to vote at least 
in presidential elections, including uh, my now home state of California, which in which women got the right to vote in 1911. Uh, but uh, after 1920, there were a number of women that could, still couldn't vote. Black women found themselves able to register and then being taken out, uh, literally forced out of the polls and uh, not being able to vote because of their race. And the suffrage movement refused to take up their cause. Puerto Rican women were unable to vote because they were from a territory. And when they got the right to vote in the 1930s, they were uh, only literate women could vote at first. Asian women who were immigrants could not vote because they were ineligible to be citizens until uh, some groups in the 1940s, but most until actually 1965 with the Voter Rights Voting Rights Act. Indigenous women couldn't vote, the majority of them, uh, although we have some pictures in the National History Museum of women, uh, Paiute women uh, voting in 1913, most Native American women couldn't vote in 1920 because Native peoples did not become American citizens as a whole until 1924. So this is a time for us to, for me to, us to think about who got the right to vote in 1920 and who was excluded and had to continue a fight for the right to vote. Yeah, thank you. I, I was just struck um, uh, doing some research and looking at your work and uh, adjacent scholarship. I was really struck by the numbers of women of color that I didn't know about who had been really active in um, suffragist struggles and in, you know, trying to get themselves enfranchised, but also their families and communities enfranchised. Um, lots of un unknown um, heroines in in that part of uh, U.S. history. Um, Val, let's go to you. I wanna ask you a little bit about, to talk about the ways that women in the Middle East have contributed to protest movements, uh, democracy movements, justice movements there. Um, particularly, um, definitely really interested in your current research around Arab Spring, but um, where maybe what some of the roots of the Arab Spring were and how women were um, making it happen. Right, thank you. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure uh, to, um, to be here. Um, I love this idea of a Zocolo, a public square. And it's very nice to follow Francille too. That was a really very instructive um, overview that she just gave. Um, uh, Women in the Middle East and North Africa have uh, been part of protest movements, actually, since at least the early 20th century. They were a small minority at the time. And uh, they were involved, uh, for example, in countries like Turkey, Iran, and Egypt. They were involved in constitutional movements um, uh, and, uh, and in some other countries in um, movements for independence, um, anti-colonial movements, and so on. Uh, so if we're thinking about um, the early 20th century, um, the 1920s, 30s, um, 40s, the 50s, where you had some post-colonial and independent struggles as well, women were involved in all of those. But uh, it was a smaller percentage. And um, a small percentage in part because there was this huge gap in uh, literacy and educational attainment between men and women at the time. Um, and also for certain cultural reasons too, it wasn't common for um, a lot of women from the popular classes in particular to, uh, you know, to come out onto the streets. But this started changing in the 60s and 70s. First, you had this whole process of state building um, and uh, you know, uh, economic and social development. And um, a larger proportion of women became beneficiaries of this kind of state-led um, uh, development, um, which was happening in other third world countries too, of course. So by the time we get to the 60s and 70s, where there's this ferment of, in particular, left-wing activism and left-wing movements around the world, especially in, in the third world, you've got this entry of women into these 
in, in most cases, rather underground, um, you know, left-wing uh, movements. What's interesting about that is that it's precisely those women who are involved in those left-wing, underground, overground, um, socialist, communist, what have you, um, organizations and movements of the 60s and 70s, who in the 1980s and 90s formed these feminist organizations. So they have already um, acquired these organizational skills, a certain capacity, a certain ability to organize, mobilize, speak, you know, research, lobby, you know, advocate, um, and go out onto the streets, um, which they did too. So they started making a presence, uh, Middle Eastern women, um, and again, there are variations across the region because, you know, if, um, if we're talking about the Gulf countries are in a category of their own. Um, so now I'm speaking about countries like Iran and Turkey and Egypt and Jordan and um, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, those countries, uh, Lebanon. Um, but, um, uh, but meanwhile, you know, you have these UN conferences and again, these educated, mobilized, organized women are, um, you know, going to the conferences, coming back and um, determined to make some changes, you know, in their own societies. Um, and so we see a growing sort of more of a critical mass of women who are involved in advocacy and in some cases in protests too. Now, protest is a little bit more difficult um, in, uh, in the 70s, 80s, well, 80s and 90s and such, because you still have these authoritarian governments. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but to the extent that they could, and there were certain rallies and demonstrations against, for example, yet another term for X, Y, or Z, you know, um, dictator or president for life, you know, you would see, uh, you know, growing numbers of women as part of those uh, protests and, and rallies. And by the time we get to the Arab Spring, um, the Arab Spring is unprecedented in terms of the numbers of women who are involved in Egypt, in Algeria, in Morocco, in Tunisia. Oh, and before that, in the 2009 uh, Green Protest in Iran. That was the first time masses of women came out into the streets um, since the revolution in 78, 79. But this time, um, the protesters were almost equally divided between men and women. I think that's so interesting. Um, what the, the aspect of the history um, where women are involved in other kinds of struggles, labor struggles, political struggles, and out of that, so that actually mirrors my own experience entering organizing and um, uh, becoming an activist. I was involved in a short period of time with racial justice issues. Um, other sisters on my campus were um, doing pro-democracy work, anti-nuclear work, uh, anti-apartheid work. And at the end of the year during spring weekend, which is often a nightmare for women on campuses, the like big party weekend, um, frustrated, all of us frustrated by the limits that we had experienced as women in those other community and campus organizations, but going into a feminist moment uh, of like, really unified feminist consciousness with some skills because we had been doing it and just um, ran a quick campaign to deal with sexual assault on our campus, won some fast things and, um, you know, came back the next year to, to go further. So that really, how feminists are born in racial justice and economic justice and pro-democracy movements, I think is um, a real thing. Yeah. It's a factor. Um, yeah. Judy, let's go to you. You have been tracking um, in particular the uh, rallies, weekly, weekly rallies of um, the so-called comfort women um, in, in Korea. So tell us a little bit about what, what you've been learning. Sure. Um, 
I've, I've actually been, it's, it's kind of interesting, I think, if, especially after Val's um, historical and uh, global picture, I feel like I'm swoop, like just zooming into something very specific. Um, but in some ways, I think that's the, the, the kind of knowledge production that I'm engaged in. I'm interviewing people who are who do the work of organizing the space behind the scenes. Um, so, the, when, so when I think about women in politics, for instance, I'm not talking about the woman who's holding the microphone on stage. In protest spaces in Korea, I've been looking at, so who set up the microphone? Who built the stage? Who laid out the red carpet? Usually, no red carpet in protests, but who prints the signs? Who cleans up afterwards? You know, if, when it's uh, if it's on the floor, there are sea cushions provided. On a cold day, you know, uh, you have uh, hand uh, hand warmers uh, distributed. Uh, in small small enough protest spaces, somebody thinks enough to uh, bring uh, boiled water for hot water and tea, um, that sort of thing. And I've time and time and again, like I've, I've noticed that this kind of attention to protest spaces fall on women. Men, for the most part, this, I mean, this is, I'm guilty of generalizing here. For the most part, these things just go past people who are not used to organizing the kind of everyday routine, ordinary spaces that protest spaces also are, right? So the statue, so for me, what's really interesting about that statue, and this is a statue that sits right, uh, it's technically behind the Japanese embassy in, uh, in the center of Seoul. And it's a statue of a young woman. It's just, there's some controversy about you know, why this figure is uh, uh, in some ways virginal, but, you know, sort of a young woman figure, innocent, uh, victim of, uh, of sexual violence. Um, and the, this is a protest site, it's a protest statue uh, instilled in, uh, that was set up in 1992 uh, by a group of women who were demanding that the Japanese uh, government um, apologize and take responsibility for drafting or you know, forcibly kidnapping in many cases and conscripting uh, Korean and other Asian women uh, into sexual slavery uh, to service the Japanese military. So this statue sits there and all that statue does, and the girl in the statue is that she's staring at the embassy 24 seven. That is the purpose of that protest. That's a, that's a figure of a woman staring insistently and persisting without giving up. Um, and what has emerged is over time, um, there have been protest spaces built around the statue. So the protest, the, the statue itself is interesting, but the space around the statue, we're talking about tent encampments when the statue is in danger of being removed uh, on special anniversaries and, you know, and occasions. It's a, it, the, 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 the circumference of, of protest space um, around the statue, you know, grows. Um, a couple of years ago when I was there in, uh, in Seoul, uh, in the summer, especially for uh, high school students and younger, actually, like a lot of middle school and elementary school students too, they, they would have field trips um, organized to visit the statue on Wednesdays when, when the weekly protests are. Um, so, you know, you would hear a roar of, you know, of children. And then so the, the, transforms, the, the space is transformed yet again, depending on who's occupying it. There's been a weekly protest since, uh, nine, since January 1992. So this is over 28 years now. Um, every Wednesday. So I think this is also another example where I think there's a, you know, there's an, there's a, a focus on uh, persistence, uh, resilience, uh, duration and longevity, and not just this kind of, you know, spontaneous, sporadic um, bursts of political energy. Yeah. Um, so and there are replicas of this statue now actually throughout North America. There's one uh, in Glendale, California, in Southern California. There's one outside of Detroit. There's one, I think that was recently installed in outside DC in Virginia, I think. So diasporic activists, Korean American activists are also sort of you know, following this model, but the kind of longevity and persistence that's demonstrated at the, um, the site of the protest in Seoul, obviously that can't be replicated because there's no other place like it. You know, um, I, duration and logistics. <laughs> Um, you know, longevity and logistics. So maybe those are two L words that are, should be really, really closely tied together. Um, I, years ago, I used to train organizers and I remember doing a training once where um, just for fun, we um, put the men in one group and the women in one group and they had to plan an accountability session where the community would challenge um, a politician. 
and the men whipped through the exercise. They were done in half the time and they had all their demands. They had the press plan made. They had everything done. The women didn't even finish the exercise because they were trying to figure out how, where was the child care going to be? How are we going to turn people out? What was the phone tree um, system going to be? And, and when you say like, the, the things that women are accustomed to taking care of, it's like, it's the logistics that are actually hospitality and inclusion, um, the things that make people feel like they are welcome and belong in at this protest, at this movement, um, in this meeting, uh, whatever it is. I'm curious about the transnational theme that has come up. Um, um, Val, you talked about women uh, women's movements in the Arab world kind of crossing borders. And Judy, you talked about the um, appearance of that statue here in the US brought by um, people in the Korean diaspora. And um, even in the, in the um, US suffragist context, it strikes me that there were other nations here in this landmass at that time that mm -hmm. actually practiced democracy feminist democracy. So would any of you want to talk about um, what transcends borders or what uh, transnational uh, relationships or identity might have to do with the strength of these movements? Can I just um, say something that came to my mind as Judy was speaking um, about, uh, you know, you put it very nicely, actually, persistence and resilience. Um, of, of what I would call, you know, feminist resistance movements. Um, and I was, of course, 28 years is quite, quite a record for South Korea, bravo. But I was also thinking, of course, of the mothers and grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo of Argentina, who uh, talk about, you know, changing history. Um, I mean, they really contributed a great deal to the delegitimization of the Argentine military dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, and the weakening of, um, of support for the dictatorship, even before, you know, the war and such. So um, that is, um, uh, I think, these two uh, examples. And we have other examples, too, of this longstanding women's protest, for example, Women in Black or in Israel, Maxim Watch. Um, you know, very, very resilient, very brave, very persistent um, women. Um, but across borders, I mean, that's, that's what we do. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and this has been um, made possible in part, I mean, it's been accelerated and facilitated by, you know, certain technological changes and such, but we've always had this. I mean, in the early 20th century, with first wave feminism, you had Egyptian women uh, as part of this, you know, International Council on Women um, and, and the meetings and such. So um, uh, I, I think that there's always been this kind of solidarity. We know that that took place also in the global, in the um, international socialist movement, for example, which was also worldwide. Um, the Democratic Women's Federation, that was also worldwide. Um, so we've always done this. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, you know, I've been uh, studying, uh, you know, what I, what I call transnational feminist networks which of course bring together women from two or, or more countries around um, you know, a common theme um, or, or set of objectives. And uh, these transnational feminist networks themselves have engaged in lobbying, in advocacy, in research, and um, around certain policy issues, uh, in particular um, geared at governments and at international organizations like the World Bank, IMF, et cetera, and talk about resilience and persistence mm -hmm. after, let me see, I don't know how many decades now, even the World Bank and the IMF have now come on board about the importance of, oh yes, paid maternity leave and quality and affordable childcare for working mothers. <laughs> so they get now this whole question also of, you know, life, family balance, life work balance, and the importance of supporting mothers who are also uh, in the workforce. So that's the kind of change that um, you know women's movements and women's organizations can make. Exactly, I think that one of the things that we don't really pay attention to is just how long these transnational women's networks have operated. Mm -hmm. And even in the 19th century, black American women were, that were involved in the abolitionist movement Oh, yeah. went to Europe 
uh, got ally, had allies in Europe, and uh, then either if they were young women in the abolitionist movement, they ended up joining these international women's groups that formed at the end of the 19th century in the Women's League for Peace and Freedom. And yeah. often they join them independently of the, the uh, white women's club movement, which often was segregated. And somebody like Mary Church Terrell made a flash in around 1906 when she spoke at one of the international women's conferences in Berlin and she gave her speech in English, German, and French. Wow. And none of the other American delegates spoke in anything but English. She was one of the, she was a graduate of Oberlin, which was one of the first colleges to uh, let women get the so-called gentleman's uh, course and get a, a BA. And so we, Somebody like uh, the school founder, Mary McLeod Bethune, insisted on going to the opening of the UN and insisted that the National, Associate, National Council of Negro Women be a member organization in the UN. So there's this long, in the 19th century, Black women often use the YWCA or uh, religious organizations, the Baptists, the Methodists, other kinds of organizations to travel, not just to Europe, but also to Asia and meet and meet women. And um, Black American women were very excited about Indian independence and uh, were, you know, often hosted uh, uh, women delegates from, to the UN. So there's a long history that's pretty, that's been made pretty invisible yeah. of women connecting both on the, so, as, as Val said, through the socialist movement, through religious movements. And um, it's, um, and I don't think we appreciate that our foremothers actually got on ships and <laughs> went <laughs> to the Far East and went, and, and actually some black women went as missionaries to Asia in the 19th and early 20th century. We, you know, they, those stories don't get told. So sometimes we, even as historians think we're the first people that travel uh, around and that transnationalism is something relatively new and it's not new at all. Yeah. Judy, what are your thoughts? Um, and yeah, no, go ahead. I was just gonna do a little thing for the audience that we're gonna do, we're gonna talk with each other till about um, 40 minutes after the hour and then we'll switch. So I'm hoping that you're getting your questions in. Our great colleagues at Zocalo Public Square are going to be feeding them to us, so. Um, and uh, after, after Judy speaks, I'm gonna put two things in the queue for the rest of us. One is tactics, you know, what have we seen in women's creativity? And uh, the other is about um, these movements on the right, like when have we seen uh, women's movements bring us uh, regressive change? So go for it, Judy. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, actually, part of the transnational connection, I was thinking about some of the, the connections that involving the, the evangelical Christian networks, uh, especially in South Korea and the U.S. context, that have significantly shaped uh, gender politics and, uh, and sexual politics. And that's also part of the transnational picture, too. Um, but I was actually, um, I, in an interesting turn of events, uh, the, uh, what's also traveled, uh, you know, cross borders are, are not just bodies, but obviously words and ideas and theories and, and movement histories. And um, I think South Korean feminists have been really trying to make an effort to uh, to learn from sexual and minority uh, movements and feminist movements and women of color movements um, in the U.S. as well. Um, in, and to apply things, in, in, a, in, a, in a, obviously, in a very different context. Um, ain't, I, in, ain't I a woman? So the, the famous... Uh, 
phrase and question uh, by Sojourner Truth um, actually made an appearance as the theme of uh, a queer activist rally in 2015. Um, and this was a, a rally uh, facing what was then the Ministry of Gender uh, and Family or something like that. So this is the, this was asserting queer um, like LGBT rights within the so-called women's rights agenda that was actually all about promoting gender equality at the expense of other minority rights. Um, so the, the lessons from black feminism in a very significant and direct way, the organizers were well aware of this. Um, they were challenging a, a, you know, an exclusive women's movement uh, that was starting to position itself as the mainstream feminist movement and making sure that the minority voices, so-called minority voices, are not forgotten in the process. And in the and, and I think it's it's the fight's obviously ongoing, um, but I think the that particular context, that particular protest in Korea, tells us that there we can't conflate women's movements and feminist movements. Um, just like women and feminists are not one and the same. And in many cases, I think women's groups and women's movements, and in the South Korean case, the woman president was, you know, they were far from feminism. Right. Yeah. Um, what about uh, tactics traveling? You know, um, we've talked about the uh, role of vigils, kind of a vigil kind of tactic and space where you're just holding a certain kind of space um, very consistently. It's a ritual. Um, we've talked about, uh, I, I haven't asked you all, but you could say, you know, what you thought, if anything, about Donald Trump's pardon of Susan B. Anthony. You know, we obviously have civil disobedience and that as a tactic. I'm curious about in your study, if you've come across um, particularly creative tactics or tactics that travel, um, that sort of somebody sees in one place and moves to another. Uh, any thoughts uh, any of you might have on? You know, if I can just uh, give a couple of examples from, uh, you know, from the Middle East. Um, you know, there's, there's so much creativity going on around the world, actually, with uh, women's movements and feminist movements in particular. Um, but, uh, you know, I think some of um, our listeners might be surprised to learn that, um, oh, yes, we do have, um, you know, uh, 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 feminists in uh, Middle East and North African countries who are both serious and comedic. So um, we've got uh, these... Um, these satires and parodies going on in Turkey and in Algeria, where they are just ridiculing misogynist men, including many of their own leaders. And um, they're able to do it and get away with it. Um, mm. So that's, that's one, um, you know, one of the uh, interesting things that's coming out of the, um, the region recently that uh, really cracks me up and, and actually, um, you know, really inspires me. Um, but, um, uh, but of course, uh, you know there are those um, uh, those tactics that 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 you mentioned. Um, um, you know, as we know, women's movements, feminist movements, are generally nonviolent. Um, although, of course, there was a little bit of violence in first wave um, England and America, and uh, uh, and and second wave a little bit. You know, generally, though, um, as a rule, women's social movements are nonviolent. But women in movements. Women can be part of movements, which, um, uh, including feminists, can be part of movements that are violent movements. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, earlier on, I mentioned you know the 60s and 70s, where you had left-wing movements. Well, some of them included guerrilla movements. Um, so women, of course, were part of certain armed struggles, and um, they. Um, uh, again, later on, some of the women who formed these independent feminist organizations came right out of those left-wing, in fact, guerrilla movements as well. You know, I know some of them personally. Um, but um, um, uh, but that is something that, you know, we, we need to accept, too, that women can be part of, of armed struggles, armed movements. Um, and, you know, especially the ones that we would consider legitimate because there are, you know, there are certain ones that, of course, we, we consider just horrendous, like ISIS or something. And I can't wrap my head around the fact that women might be attracted to uh, some atrocious organization like that. Um, but, uh, but they also varied. Um, and more recently, I think, you know, some people have been 
thinking about and talking about the Kurdish women of um, northeast um, Syria um, in the YPG. And uh, that's a very interesting uh, kind of experiment in feminism, in a certain type of municipal, autonomous, um, socialism, uh, communitarianism. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting um, experiment that almost got wiped out when, um, unfortunately, uh, Trump gave the green light to the Turks to invade in October of last year. But I think they're still um, persisting. So it's something that we, we have to bear in mind, that there are women who will bear arms. Um, and, uh, and they are women on the left side, on the progressive side, on the feminist side. Um, and then uh, I think later on, we might talk about right wing women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, next question. Go ahead, Francio. I was just going to say, uh, and my graduate students have done more work on this, but both with the Arab Spring and, and Black Lives protests in Canada and in England and also in Israel, there have been the social media has allowed people, allowed activists across the world to give uh, advice, uh, advice on uh, what to do about tear gas, what it, even when things are nonviolent, they, they're, they've used Instagram, they've used Twitter, uh, YouTube, other things to really communicate with each other. And I think this is happening in France and other places as well. So I think that the uh, mainstream media hasn't really noticed as much, uh, scholars are st just starting to write about it, how much the um, current social, social uh, movements are um, communicating with each other in actually in real time it, there was more of a lag in the 60s and 70s, uh, although um, um, people paid attention to Malcolm X and other people traveling. And there were there's an organization called uh, Sojourners of, of Black American Women on the far left, Sojourners for Truth and Justice, that were very involved in international um, struggles. So I, I think that what's going on now the ability to, for people that are protesting in Ferguson or Baltimore to be in touch with people that are protesting in London and in Tel Aviv is truly remarkable and really interesting the way that they're able to communicate. Hmm. Let's go to the question about um, conservative outcomes or re regressive outcomes that um, also result uh, from women's activism and women's protest. Um, it has not escaped my notice that in this country, recent anti-masking protests have um, certainly had a lot of men, but not exclusively. And many of the many of the leaders, at least online and in small videos. Um, have been women and many of the, whether they're protesting in front of the Michigan State House or um, in their local grocery store where they're asked to put on a mask. So, so clearly um, there are other outcomes that are possible. All my friends have watched Mrs. America, but I can't do it. I lived it. <laughs> I lived it. I don't need to watch it yet. Uh, but that's another example of Phyllis, the role that Phyllis Schlafly played. So um, what are your thoughts on on that, on that set of politics among women? I think it's just, I think women, progressive women delude themselves when they think that all women are progressive and that all women see, you know, think the same. And uh, in fact, 52% of white women voted for President Trump. Right. And there's still a number of women who say they don't want to have a woman president or a woman boss. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and I grew up in St. Louis, so I was not, I didn't grow up very far from Phyllis Slash, Slashley. And I have to say, you know, having grown up during segregation, the idea 
that uh, you have conservative women is not at all surprising to me. You know that I, that women support it. White women. Support I hate to interrupt you, but like um, the idea that you have conservative women who still think of themselves as feminists, right? They're about women's leadership, women taking their role in the world, and it's conservative, but at least to them, still feminist. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Francine. Right. Yeah. No, it's 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 true, and you know it's. It's they want to have, to be a part of the uh, status quo. They want to move up in and take their rightful place as they see it in the status quo. Whereas women on the left want to change the social order and, and make and, and change it so that it's available to more people. I'm not going to make say that the left is perfect, but there's a greater commitment to look at sexual minorities, racial minorities, other other groups. And so I think it's the difference between wanting to be a part of the regime and wanting to change the levers of power. So uh, and also our just confusion about what feminist feminism is. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Judy. I, I mean, conservative women, I have to talk about the, the former president of South Korea, just, I mean, because it was such a clear example of uh, a woman who actually people like my mother uh, remember as the young daughter of a beloved dictator. <laughs> So, I mean, the, the sob story, the melodrama that goes with her rise as a politician is a family history of authoritarian rule. Her mother was assassinated when her father was the president. Um, so she grew up in the so-called blue house in Korea, they call it. It's like the White House um, as the acting lady, the first lady. Like this, this is her whole mythology of coming into power. Um, as a woman. Um, so of course she rallied the conservative votes. She got elected in 2012, I think, uh, and she was impeached and imprisoned um, when I was there in 2016 uh, during a, the, a you know, series of mass protests that um, took place, uh, I think over 27 consecutive Saturdays. So again, the, the kind of consecutive, the, the long running protests that have um, affected change in South Korea, that this was another example, but a couple of those protests, I mean, we're looking at easily a million, a million and a half people gathered in the same space. So it was an astounding sight to see. But what was mixed in within those mass protests were efforts to denigrate the president, even if she was a horrible, horrible president that people wanted to oust and imp like impeach and then oust and, and imprison in that order. Um, but they, at, at the beginning, there were um, efforts to uh, to use misogynist um, epithets, uh, to use uh, sexist uh, remarks to you know to diminish her her status. Um, you know, comments like "This is what you get when you elect a female president," for instance, or "This ruins it." Like you know, we'll never have another woman president after this. Like this sort of thing, and it was feminists who didn't agree with her, who not didn't they didn't defend her. But they, it was, they insisted on the organizers to put a stop to this kind of discourse. Mm -hmm. And I think they did an amazing job in actually putting the brakes uh, and not removing gender from politics, you can't do that, but to make sure that women aren't, uh, aren't denigrated and that this kind of speech uh, and practices should not be allowed in the public square, literally in the public square. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Al, do you want to get in on this before we go to audience questions? More? Yeah, this uh, yeah, this has been such an important discussion because, I mean, how do we account for conservative women? Um, and how big is the feminist tent, you know? Um, and um, I, I think it was, um, I think it was the first woman's march after Trump's um, inauguration where there was a group of, um, self-identified Catholic feminists who were, however, anti-abortion. And I believe they were not uh, allowed to take part. Mm. Um, at the time, I thought that was a mistake. Um, now, uh, remember, I also work on and in the Middle East and North Africa, where we have a lot of women who are calling themselves Muslim feminists. 
they too are opposed to abortion. Um, and they are opposed to, you know, certain things that many feminists find um, very important. Um, uh, but um, uh, but there, there has to be a way of building bridges uh, across this divide. Otherwise, it's precisely those women who will go to the right wing, who will go to the far right. And, and we don't want that. We want them to be able to come to our side we want to let them know that there isn't necessarily this kind of, I don't know, dogmatic litmus test for, you know, what makes um, a feminist. But I mean, after all, you know, in second wave feminists, we have these different categories of, you know, radical, social, fem Marxist, liberal, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and eventually those categories sort of dissipated. Um, but it seems to me that Sometimes it seems to me that today, again, we've gone back to a very exclusivist um, definition of, of feminism. And in order to be a feminist, you have to be X, Y, or Z, or you have to do X, Y, or Z. Um, and we might actually be reaching a point where we have to rethink all of this. And in particular, rethink um, what is the place of conservative women who are not right-wing reactionary women mm -hmm. uh, because of course that kind of ideological divide will always uh you know happen and take place i mean i know about that from iran so let me just give you an example of, of of iran at the beginning right after the revolution um you know feminists like myself you know we were secular um and either left-wing like me or liberal like others you know so but we were all secular and we were appalled by Islamization and by you know the new laws of the Islamic Republic and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, you had a group of women who were very much attached to the Khomeini project, to um, to the building of an Islamic Republic, to Islamic law and so on and so forth. We couldn't understand it. There was a huge ideological gulf. We detested each other. <laughs> Something happened in the early 1990s. Well, I mean, there were some changes going on in the latter part of the 1980s. A group of those Islamist women started engaging in something called ishtihad, which is independent reasoning of you know, Islamic law. Some of us in the West started studying this, Afsan and Najwa Badi, um, uh, Ziba Mir Hosseini, myself, Nayeda Tawhidi, we called it Islamic feminism. So these are very pious women who started moving in our direction, in fact. And we were also, now, among the secularists, by the way, there were two camps. One camp was very happy about this. You know, I was, for example. And another camp of staunch <laughs> feminists were absolutely opposed to any conversation with these Islamic feminists. And this kind of argument went on for several years in print also. Um, and I've written about it as well. But eventually, we've come around. We work together. We admire each other. We think it's very important. I personally feel that those Islamic feminists are then so important in bringing in others to the fold, to the uh, larger Islamic fold. I wish that okay. could happen in the United States. Yeah. Uh, well, there are times in which it has happened, and it's possible we're headed toward those times again now. <laughs> um, and actually, the next question, which comes from the audience, might speak to one of the current divides uh, in the US and in women's movements, probably worldwide. And the question is, um, can any of you talk about the role of trans women in women's protest, protests and protest movements? Um, I, the, the co-president uh, of the Women's March Board with me is a woman named Isa Noyola, who um, is an attorney and a leader at Mi Gente, the Lati Latinx organization Mi Gente, and who is a trans Latina. Um, and it, it works out great for us, but what are your thoughts and what are you observing um, mm -hmm. about, about the trans women and the question of trans women's participation in women's Right. I mean, I, I think listening to Val, I think I was actually thinking specifically, yeah, uh, especially about trans exclusionary feminist spaces um, that are also uh, uh, starting to emerge in uh, in South Korea. 
I mean, talk about different camps. If in Korea, for instance, if there was a group of women around the com- like rallying around comfort women uh, and justice um, for former survivors of the comfort women, the sexual slavery system, we also had uh, mostly young uh, women, who, women who previously didn't identify as feminists necessarily, who necessarily weren't even interested in politics, organizing unprecedented mass rallies um, after a, a woman was murdered uh, in a kind of a busy city um, in, in Gangnam District, the famous Gangnam District. Um, and what transpired um, out of that feminist, uh, that, that set of uh, uh, feminist protests was was not only for them to demand uh, the removal of gender neutral restrooms because crimes might uh, get committed in them by, by men, um, but also subsequently led to that camp sort of moving on to uh, a particular strand of trans exclusion, exclusionary, um, anti-trans uh, feminist politics where protest spaces were uh, monitored um, to disallow, to prohibit uh, non-women, non-biological women from even entering. Um, so these kinds of politics, I think, uh, come with the territory of policing any line, obviously. I think when I was actually first invited uh, to for this, I, my, the for, first question to myself was, what do they mean by women? <laughs> uh, I think precisely because I was uh, thinking about the exclusion of, uh, of trans women um, in women's yeah. spaces. Yeah, thank you. Here's a slightly related question. So um, a, a listener wants to know, if you, the speakers, think that women's protests are a thing of the past, and what the what the speaker, I mean, what the listener is pointing to is the women's part, not the protest mm-hmm. part. So, do younger generations think more about humans protesting? And you know, we're so far out of the gender binary that we don't even need women's protests anymore or women's movements. Or do women still? Um, uh, need a specific, identifiable uh, a movement that speaks to that identity of ours. Francine? Well, women are, women are, that, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to be quick. I think that um, so much depends on the moment. We saw the Women's March, and at least in Los Angeles, the Women's March had men, women, children, people of all gender identities, and uh, but it was still a women's march, uh, and but it wasn't exclusionary. And I think that more and more people are moving toward that. It's still the case in sort of larger issues, at least among Black Uh, Americans, it would seem that even though Black Lives Matter was created by three queer Black women, that uh, the deaths of Black men somehow are often magnified more than the deaths of Black women. Uh, And so uh, Kimberly Crenshaw uh, has uh, helped to found the Say Her Name movement. Mm -hmm. And I think that has made more people, men and women, talk about Brianna uh, Taylor in a way that hadn't been happening with the hundreds of other black, the, the literally hundreds of black women that have died in police hands in the last 20 years. And so I do think that uh, there's still a place and a reason for women to be active and join in struggles. And I really appreciated Judy's comments because the issue of both homophobia within the women's movement in the US, transphobia within the gay community in the US, and, you know, like for and within the Black community, and yet. Uh, Black, trans uh, men and women are uh, at risk for both suicide, for police violence. And I think that whereas these conversations didn't happen so much before, it's they are at least happening. And people are saying, we, you know, we are who we are, you know, and 
you, you can't take either my racial identity or my sexual gen or gender identity away. It's all a part of me. And so I, I, you have to include me in all of the discussions. And I think that this is an, a really important moment that brings in the intersections of a number of movements, women's movements, movements for uh, it's queer and trans people. Uh, and, um, and it's interesting that to me that this is happening around the world. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it's safe for trans people around the world, but it does mean that where there was silence before, there is at least an openness to discuss, even if trans people are saying you are making, are, are insisting on that openness. Al, do you want to get in on this before we do the last couple of questions? Uh, to be sure, um... There is obviously a diffusion of, of this particular issue of um, LGBT um, and, uh, in particular, um, you know, trans um, trans conditions and rights. Um, in the Middle East, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, the complexion of these kinds of social movements really um, is context specific, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't all look the same um, in uh, in every um, context. Um, and, uh, you know, the movements vary also by, you know, political, cultural, but also socioeconomic issues and priorities. In the Middle East, for example, Turkey and to um, a certain degree, Lebanon would have been the two countries which are a little, have been a little bit more open. And that's where issues of sexuality and sexual rights and um, LGBT were uh, uh, talked about um, in public a little bit more openly than any of the other countries. Even so, because of, um, well, in Turkey, because of the authoritarianism of, of the president, and in Lebanon, because of the horrific economic crisis that they've had, and now, most recently, this dreadful tragedy, I mean, you know, this is what is taking um, uh, priority these days, of course, how to uh, repair the economy and how to uh, restore justice to the, um, you know, to these people who have been so let down by their incompetent, inept, useless government. But going back to this question of whether protest, women's protest is a thing of the past. No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is all the proof we need right there. Anyway, that, um, that's Algeria. And, and uh, Francille, speaking of identity, um, and Judy as well, the, this is this pretty girl over here. She is from the Amazigh, or otherwise known as Berber, um, uh, ethnic group in Algeria. And uh, protests have erupted again in uh, quite a number of Middle Eastern countries, including Algeria. Um, and they began last year and went on until you know the pandemic took off. But um, but uh, no, you. protests are yeah. not a thing of the past, yeah. and they're and going not on. women's protests either. Um, I'm going to put out two questions and um, see who wants to address them. Uh, I'll just put them both out at the same time as, uh, and then we'll start to wrap up soon after that. So first question is, should it be a requirement that there be a certain number of women in government? Should we set some kind of goal of, of parity or 50% or um, whatever we think is appropriate? Is that is that a good thing to fight for even? And the other question I'll pick out of this mix is, um, do you think that men and women differ somehow in their activism? Uh, do women, uh, we haven't talked a lot about men in this hour, which is appropriate, <laughs> I guess, but are there particular um, approaches that feel very gendered and, and different? So um, anyone who wants to address any either of those? I'll take the second question. Actually, it's, it speaks to a lot of the research that I've been doing on protest, protest cultures, um, where we see forms of protest beyond the, the mass mobilization, the, the labor rallies and um, strikes, for instance, um, but also uh, workers, for instance, performing painstaking Buddhist prostration processions through the street um, over many days. So we're talking about full body prostration, where you begin standing, you kneel, you touch elbows and you touch your forehead to the sidewalk and then you get up and you do it again 
And this is over and over and over again. So you could imagine, you know, such forms of protest as well as long-term, you know, tent uh, occupation, uh, the tent encampments on the street, hunger strikes. Um, these are self-immolation. Obviously, these are uh, physically, um, uh, you know, uh, just uh, very, uh, it's, yeah, it takes a toll um, on one's body. But one story that I actually remember um, uh, particularly distinctly was is a long time uh, labor organizer who I didn't even know was a long time labor organizer because I, I knew that she was only uh, working on this particular case of organizing hospital workers uh, in a smaller city called Chengju. Um, and Guanokja is her name. And she turns out she had actually had previous experience stint as an organizer in different sites. Um, so this is again the kind of you know repetition of um, of protest uh, practices, but she said that she's done everything. She's done tent occupation, like, you know, occupation tents. She's done high rise uh, occupations, like you know, occupying like bill, uh, uh, billboards and construction cranes. She's done hunger strikes over you know over two months, um, but the hardest thing she's had to do was to shave her head um, in protest. There's a public, public head shaving ceremony that uh, a lot of activists do. And it wasn't because she was vain, but it was because then that meant she had to face her in-laws every day um, with the shaved head. So for me, that was a really important reminder of protests taking place and not just being left uh, in the space of the square. Um, but a, pro it's a certain part, you know, a, a certain politics of embodiment where you you have to bring bring that protest into into your daily space, uh, daily uh, you know daily space, your everyday life. And in her case, that was just as tough. Uh, that side of patriarchy um, and dealing with family expectations uh, was just as tough as in the public square. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. Um, how about you, Val or Francine? Either question. Um, should we have? certain number of women in government or do men and women uh, activists differently? I'm going to do a Sarah Cooper here and make an activist into a verb. Do we activists differently? I'm going to take that first question about, um, uh, about representation um, because, um, you know, uh, the U.S. is quite the outlier. I'd like to hear Francille on this uh, as well, because, um, you know, you expect that countries where you have high educational attainment and you have um, high female labor force participation and you have a so-called democracy, um, that you would have um, a higher representation of women in um, the seats of power, especially in you know the equivalent of a parliament, the Congress, and and so on, and that's not the case. We don't have that in the in the United States. Now, uh, some people will argue, some scholars will argue, it's because of the American political system, uh, which is not a parliamentary system. It's not a um, a proportional representation system, which is much more conducive to this sort of thing, where parties have lists of people and constituents have to vote for people on that list. Um, and it's a highly individualized uh, political system here, so people just vote for um, individuals. Um, so um, I, I don't know. I mean, when, when I have seen the group, you know, certain groups of women in, in American politics, I mean, they, they've been, you know, rather impressive. And I keep thinking that perhaps if we had more of them, you know, things actually might change in the United States um, um, as, as they have. But on the other hand, um, the, the, um, the research is mixed um, on the question of um, whether having um, a large proportion of women in, um, uh, in politics, in the uh, formal, um, uh, in, in government, does make a difference in terms of legislation and such. The, the research actually is mixed on that, and it depends mm. on the countries and, and so on. Um, so. Um, I can see it going either way myself and um, for simply for reasons of equity and equality and egalitarianism. Yes, you need to have since women are usually 50 percent, if not more, 51 or 52 percent of any given population, then they should have equal uh, representation. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the question of whether or not um, it may actually uh, change the political culture in a more progressive um, direction that remains to be seen. Thank you. 
Francie, you're going to have our last word here. So you can address either one of these questions or I'm going to allow you to say whatever you want <laughs> uh, that you think we need well, to hear. I'd love to have the last word. Uh, I agree with Val. It's very con context specific. But I will say that if you look, and I'm sure this will be true this year, if you look at the difference between the Democratic National Convention and the Republican National Convention, you'll see what Fannie Lou Hamer and Black women activists did in 1964 when they created the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and really shook up the Democrats. The Democrats have changed their um, const not what it, their rules so that each state delegation has to look like the state. It has to look ethnically and gender like the state. And I think that that is actually more important than a law that would say you need X number of women in Congress. Uh -huh. And it's also the case that Black Americans are more likely to vote for women candidates and elect women candidates than whites. And I haven't seen the figures for other ethnic groups, but of course, I'm living in California, so you know it may not be true for other groups, but we have a large number of Hispanic women that are Latinx women that are uh, have been elected to Congress. Of course, we have two women senators. And uh, it's only when uh, Kamala Harris be has become the vice presidential nominee that people have started making really sexist remarks about her. But before, no, people, you know, we have Dianne Feinstein. Before that, we had Barbara Boxer, Nancy Pelosi. So I think in some places, it's not, it's seen as fine that there are women candidates. But in general, women get blamed for the things that we prize in men. They get blamed if they're ambitious. Even Biden's advisors were critical of almost all of the women candidates, saying that they were too ambitious. Uh, they So I think we do have a long way to go in our own country, in our own um, thinking about why we, in, and even including women, why we judge women and men so differently. Mm. Well said. Um, I just want to thank everybody so much, um, all of our panelists, for just these incredible stories, the inspiration, the fun, the examples. Um, uh, I just feel myself in in really a full global legacy of feminist organizers and protesters and direct actors um, after this conversation with all of you. So, so appreciate it. And also really, really thinking about women's creativity and, um, and about tactical and strategic decisions that are actually grounded in our actual lives and our communities and in some ways in the most mundane parts of our lives that um, nevertheless turn out to be um, so, so, so important, how we're taking care of the kids um, or how we are uh, caring for people, how we're burying people, how we're grieving, um, and how we are asking for the respect that, that we deserve. Um, asking, I can't believe I used that word, how we are giving <laughs> the respect that we deserve. Uh, so thank you all listeners also for your very excellent questions. We're gonna close here for tonight. We appreciate you joining us. This video will be published on ZocaloPublicSquare.org and also as a podcast. Uh, you'll also be able to read a summary of the discussion, short interviews with our panelists. We did some fun ones earlier today. 
and lots of other essays and articles about women's history and the history of social movements at Zocalo Public Square. As a reminder, this event is the first in a series of three that are co-presented with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County in connection with their current exhibit, Rise Up LA, which Francille worked on, on women's history and activism. Please come back for the next one. It's about a month from now on September 16th, and we're asking why don't women's votes put more women in power? <laughs> Excellent question. Thank you again so much, Judy, Valentin, Francile, for sharing your insights with us. And thank you again to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, as well as to ZocaloPublicSquare.org uh, for co-presenting tonight's event. It's been great to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.